Yeah, welcome everybody to the session about science vision next decade. And what could be better uh, than to invite colleagues from all over the world and to discuss with us what are the next challenges that we have to solve as scientists. And we are very pleased to have almost everybody here instead of Jung. Um, but others made it. Uh, also, we had two cancellations, three cancellations, but brain researchers are really flexible, as we learned during this, this Congress. So, very warm welcome. Uh, Victor and me will lead the discussion. And I would like to start uh, to introduce uh, our first panelist, this is Stephanie Forkel. So, Stephanie is a PI at the Donners Institute in the Netherlands and leader of the language and communication team across the Donners Institute. Um, interestingly, she is also or has been visiting professor in Munich, associate professor at King's College, and uh, she's internationally very active. Uh, presently, she is uh, serving as a program chair at the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. I would say this is one of the most influential and uh, important uh, organizations in the neuroscience field, dealing with neuroimaging in particular, of the healthy, but also of the diseased human brain. So thank you very much, Stephanie, for being here. And uh, let's start with, uh, with a statement from your point of view uh, regarding future neuroscience. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I have to say the last couple uh, of days were extremely exciting and inspiring. So my own research looks at the connections in the brain, the connection anatomy of the brain, meaning the white matter, and how we can conceptualize function in the context of connection anatomy. Now, going forward, I apply this method in the healthy and the pathological brain, so in particular in stroke, neurodegeneration, and um, brain tumors. And the thing that we're really missing and where I hope that technology will help us going forward is predicting recovery. So right now, when a patient comes into the clinic, with a stroke, it's really difficult to say where that patient will be in a year's time. And that is essential information for the patient, the next of kin, but also for the clinicians and society at large. So this is where I hope that new technology can help us to build better predictive models and also rehabilitation tools to help patients. Thank you, Stephanie. This was very clear. We continue with the introductions. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you, Stephanie. Um, from Japan, we have the pleasure of <laughs> having you here, <laughs> Professor Toshi Otsuka. Uh, he's a professor in uh, biochemistry, molecular biochemistry, and has made major contributions in uh, better understanding the structure and function of the. Uh, active presynaptic uh, zone. In particular, over the last years, he has developed a major interest in neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer and Parkinson. Very importantly uh, for this discussion, he has also been a lead person, a program officer in the Japanese Brain Initiative and uh, in uh, Brain Minds in particular. Yeah. Yeah? Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for introduction. So I was very much Ah, oh, uh, the, first of all, I want to say thank you, Catherine and Victor and the, the, the committee members for this uh, HBB summit. I was uh, actually uh, very much worried about the strikes in Germany and uh, France, but the, I made it. Thank you. <laughs> so, oh, and I have a slide for my, you know, uh, presentation. So can I uh, make a presentation so should, using did you upload slide the slide? later? later? No. Now? You have some slides. Yeah, right. Okay. In, the, in the three minutes? Yes, yeah. please. Otsuka a des diapos. D'accord, c'est parti. They will be displayed. Ah, okay. Okay, so thank you again. So I would like to introduce uh, the, our BRAIN project in Japan briefly, uh, the next uh, three minutes. Okay. <clears throat> um, the, I'm Toshi Otsuka from the uh, University of Yamanashi in Japan, 
and I'm a program officer and also a member for um, executive committee at the International Brain Initiatives. I'm specialized in the biochemistry and the neuroscience. Okay, so <clears throat> our first brain project in Japan called the Brain Minds um, started in uh, 2014, around the, the nine years ago, uh, which has been uh, focused on the marmoset brain. Uh, have been, have been uh, studying um, the neural circuits and the marmosets uh, to gain new insights into the healthy and the diseased um, the human brain. After four years, um, the, um, 2018, uh, another um, second brain um, project brain, called Brain Minds Beyond started, uh, which has been focused on the human brain. One of the objects is the uh, interspecies, uh, the comparison of the neural circuitry of the human and the non-human primates, uh, such as the marmosets and the macaque monkeys. Uh, these two uh, projects have, they, they open up uh, new um, opportunities for uh, international collaboration as below, um, such as the marmoset database and the human MRI database, the collaboration with the human connection project, and also with the participation in the international um, brain initiative or uh, IBI. <coughs> So um, the, I don't I don't have oh, I'm sorry uh, they're slightly busy slide for uh, but the, um, the here are some example uh, or achievements in the brain minds the the first there we developed the world's uh, only integrated uh, database of the marmosets brain images and the second we developed novel technologies uh, to bridge the gap in the hierarchy from uh, micro uh, to the macro levels. Uh, one of the, the example is the world's uh, largest and the fastest, um, the, the wide field to photon microscopy, uh, which was uh, published in Neuron uh, uh, last year. And lastly, the, we developed marmoset um, disease models for Alzheimer and the Parkinson's diseases. We are now currently at the, under uh, extensive tough revisions, uh, but the, after that, we will be uh, uh, published the, uh, the nice papers uh, in shortly. <clears throat> so we believe that um, the elucidation of the marmoset entire neural circuitry is one of the keys uh, to understand our human uh, characteristics. Um, the, the, and I don't, I don't have much time, so I skip these. Uh, the, here is the, the example of the brain minds beyond. Um, so um, the, unfortunately, these projects will end uh, this year. <clears throat> So we have to think about the next project. We are now um, extensively discussing uh, the next project. Um, here's my opinion, uh, not official ones, admitted by our uh, uh, funding agency and or uh, government, okay? It's my opinion. And the next five years, we have to, uh, we will to, um, you know, um, the develop the mathematical models reflecting um, higher brain uh, function dynamics um, uh, which is developed in the, in the human brain, for example, in the, our you know, uh, frontal lobe, uh, including neural circuits as well as the uh, pathological models. And also we produce, uh, reproduce them digitally, uh, the digital brain or second brain, uh, the concepts. So, but uh, the, <clears throat> as you just say, the idea we have to corroborate and or uh, make a distinction with the, that of the human brain project in the EU uh, I don't prefer to, you know, competition. <laughs> I love collaboration and the, and the distinctions. So this approach will lead to um, the world's most advanced marmoset research infrastructure and integrating the dry and the wet experiments and the collaborating with the basic and the clinical researches. And also the, we are utilizing the multi-double and the multi-dimensional uh, uh, large-scale brain uh, data. So here is the uh, other, um, some example of the research topics, but the uh, for uh, time limits, I will skip. Anyway, so uh, <clears throat> we are now um, extensively um, discussing the next project, but uh, we expect to have an, an overview of this, our um, Japanese brain project, next project this fall, and so pray stay tuned. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Toshi. Yeah, our next panelist is uh, Yong Yao, virtually present here at our summit. Yong, can you hear us? 
Yes, you yes. can. <laughs> Very warm welcome. So Yong Ya is program director at the National Institute of Mental Health, and uh, he is leading activities in the field of the Brain Cell Atlas um, as part of the uh, NIH initiative um, for, for human brain research. And his institute participates um, to, the, um, to this NIH brain initiative, which is really a large effort that was founded more or less uh, in, in parallel to our human brain project, also to 2013. And we are now very curious uh, of learning more where you see the next steps uh, of developing uh, brain science in the, in the years coming. Uh, thank you, uh, Catherine, for the nice introduction. Uh, good morning, bonjour, good morning. Uh, let me show uh, a few slides, uh, taking uh, three minutes uh, to introduce uh, a few current programs of the U.S. NIH Brain Initiative. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. So the NIH Brain Initiative is now rolling out three large-scale transformative projects as summarized in a recent cell paper by Dr. John Nye, who is the director of the NIH Brain Initiative. The first large-scale project is to build comprehensive brain cell atlases in human, monkey, and mouse, aiming to provide a complete catalog or parts list of brain cell types to review the developmental and the evolutionary principles underlying brain function and the diseases. The second large scale project is to develop a, and leverage technologies for comprehensive atlases of brain connectivity at synaptic and axonal resolutions. And the third large scale project is to provide cell type specific targeting tools for experimental manipulation and the recording of the identified cell types to allow the study of neural circuits with greater precision. So NIH Brain Cell Atlas project started as a three-year pilot in 2014 and was then quickly scaled up into Brain Initiative Cell Census Network in 2017, with hundreds of scientists across three continents to generate a cell address of the adult mouse brain, as well as begin to create cell addresses of human and non-human primate brains. Using the advanced single cell analysis technologies, the brain cell address project has by now completed a highly integrated multimodal analysis of cell types in whole adult mouse brain. Three, uh, there will be a series of papers coming out this year, three of which uh, were published this month on a complete whole adult mouse brain transcriptomic cell atlas. About 5,000 transcriptomic cell types have been identified through this effort with genome-wide expression mapped to a common colony framework of mouse brain. Over the next five years, the NIH Brain Cell Atlas Project will continue building up brain cell atlas in human, with the emphasis on human and non-human primates, and also developing mouse, uh, with comprehensive transcriptomic epigenomic and the imaging profiling of brain cell diversity across lifespan. As a result, I expect a large volume of single cell genomic and imaging data will be generated across scale, species, environmental stages, and assay modalities. We will develop computational infrastructure, standards, ontology and the interoperable data ecosystem under fair principles to bring a variety of data sets into common coordinate frameworks to enable data analysis and integration. 
I'm really very excited for the opportunity for collaboration and look forward to a discussion and coordination with our colleagues in Europe and Japan and other countries toward the future generation of digital brain addresses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jung. And, and I would like to emphasize, so for Jung, it's really early in the morning. And thank you for being here and discussing with us the next steps. That's right. <laughs> thank you. Um, our last panelist is Professor Randy McIntosh. Um, uh, Randy is Chair of Neuroscience and Neurotechnology at Simon Fraser University in Canada. And uh, before, he has served for more than a decade, I believe, as Vice President uh, for Research at uh, Baycrest uh, in Toronto. Um, and uh, I, as, if I understand correctly, right now you have just been elected Deputy uh, Chair of INS, uh, I, INCF, right? INS, sorry, that's my in institute. Yeah. So, <laughs> INCF. <laughs> so, what I'm trying to say is uh, Randy McIntosh has an enormous experience in coordinating large structures and infrastructures in particular. Yeah? Randy, would you like to share your statement with us? Sure, thank you, Victor, and thank you for the invitation. It's nice to be here again. Um, yeah, so I, I think, um, my perspective on technology and computing and neuroscience and the next uh, frontiers or next phases, um, I think really comes from the intersection of my experience both in Toronto and, in, and more recently now in Vancouver. Um, so in Toronto, I was working primarily in brain health and aging, focused on obviously healthy brains, um, but also in dementia. Um, and seeing uh, the challenges that came from um, having to deal with pa patients who had very severe cognitive impairments and try and find ways to make their lives better um, through technology, through social interactions, and through finding ways to build pathways to improve the interactions between the patients, families, um, and the researchers. And we didn't get there. Um, and I moved to, to Vancouver, and my, my title is about six or seven sentences long, but it's basically uh, the chair of uh, neuroscience and technology across the lifespan. So to capture the idea that um, we're really looking at ways to mobilize technology, computing, and mental processes that have both the scientists, the, the families, the patients, and the communities to interact, to find new pathways, to open communications, to allow us to build new technologies that help both us discover new things about the brain, but also take that knowledge and ensure that the patients that we're working with, the clients that we're working with, the communities that we're working with benefit from that and actually use it as a new method, if you will, to engage in a conversation that will not only improve clinical care, but also improve the health for all of us going forward. Thank you. So for me, <laughs> thank you. If I may continue, Stephanie, we, we heard from Jung, uh, also from, from Toshi, that they put quite some, um, well, it's quite some efforts into decoding the cellular structure of the brain and, and also investing into infrastructures and, and services and tools to share all that. So where do you see for the neuroimaging community, which is coming, I would say, from the different um, side of, uh, of the spectrum from the macroscopic level? So, so how can you make, uh, this usable in, in the next years? What are your thoughts on that? So I think uh, the first thing that's an important new development is that we all come out of our silos. So in the new imaging community for many years, if you did structural imaging, you didn't really look at functional imaging. If you did functional imaging, you didn't really look at structural imaging. And we're now breaking those boundaries and actually do multimodal imaging and also consider imaging across the scales. And there's a big push to actually bring the two ends closer together. And that could be by having things like the uh, digital atlas where you can just overlay all the different layers and zoom in as we've seen yesterday in the keynote. Um, but also our tools are getting better and better to bridge that gap. 
Um, for example, we now are getting a 14 Tesla in vivo scanner um, in the Netherlands. That's, that's going to help us quite a lot to zoom into the brain more and more detail and slowly start to bridge the gap going forward. Because really to come up with models that are informative about the healthy functioning of the brain, but also for patients, we need to have a full understanding of the brain and not just look at isolated aspects of it. If I may follow up on this, Stephanie, uh, we have heard from all of you actually making statements about adding uh, more details in our understanding in terms of the data and uh, characterizing it uh, to a very large degree. Uh, data is important, there's absolutely no question, and we need a fine resolution thereof. But we need to link it to some causal structures to be able to make actually prediction. Yeah? Causal structure, uh, Toshi, you uh, said your personal opinion is it needs to be linked to a mathematical model. This is just another way of saying a causal structure <coughs> that is predictive, essentially. What, how, how do you see the next step forwards in, as you also said, Stephanie, that we need to be able to make uh, predictions for patients uh, what are the next steps forward in order to make these linkages, in order for the data to become actually predictable? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, in Japan, so we have the same uh, problem. Um, the, because, and the, you know, uh, for example, the, we have the collecting a much, much uh, big data uh, from the patients using the functional MRI. But the problem is that the, the data are uh, scattered uh, throughout our country, okay? And the different kinds of data, uh, different um, fun, um, MRI machines, Siemens and the G health gears. And so um, the, <clears throat> the, the, the option is uh, we go to the, we have the um, several traveling subject. Uh, the same person uh, go to the different institutions in the different kinds of analysis, and, but the, the, the person is the same. And the, but the data is a very different. So we have to reorganize uh, these different data with the, uh, you know, uh, the, with the AI and uh, you know, um, uh, mathematical models. We have to think about, uh, but the, it still take a time. But this trapping subject is much easier uh, because Japan is somewhat a small country and uh, easily trouble. And uh, so um, we have to make a step uh, for such kind of the, the research, but the, and also we uh, we think um, uh, we need to uh, um, the very much secure the, and the big crowd system and the, to uh, integrate and our data in Japan and not only Jap uh, um, domestic in Japan but also uh, international project like uh, international brain initiative. So we we have to to correct uh, the big data throughout the world. And, but the, the, we need a breakthrough uh, for um, um, analyzing the big data with the AI or um, you know, machine, uh, machine interface. Yeah, I think. If I can maybe um, move up, come off of that last, last comment, I think one of the things, and this I think is the subtext of your original question, Victor, is that um, uh, just collecting the data and analyzing it in sort of conventional forms is only going to get us so far. Um, really have to find a way to try and merge these data across different scales. Um, and if we're going to be collecting data from everything from cells, molecular aspects, all the way up to systems, um, we at have have some point have to put that all back together because that's how the system works. And that's where generative model, computational models come in. Um, and the nice thing about the platforms that are being developed now um, is each um, scale has its own um, sort of preferred method of modeling. Um, and those models can be linked across scales as well. And that's actually, I think, one of the next frontiers is trying to find ways to take the mathematical models that describe synaptic flows, that describe cellular circuits, that describe system level um, operations, and finding ways to link those in some formal way. And that gets closer to the causal mechanisms that I think that you were alluding to. And that's actually something I think is, is, I see that as one of the potential impacts where eBrains could really make a big difference, is that all of those features seem to be encapsulated in that platform. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can probably do that uh, not, in the not too distant future. Thanks. Uh, I fully agree with what you two said. But also, um, 
the complexity of the brain and the modalities that we have is fascinating and it's an academic exercise to map it all across the scales. But looking at patients, for example, most clinics don't have the facilities that we have in a research setting. So we need to use what we have, the complexity in our data, the volume of our data these days, to inform our understanding of the brain and how it works. But when we bring it back to the clinic, we actually have to use a more simple model. And we've just heard that in the, in the last keynote talk, fancy anatomical modeling, but when it comes to the patient, you need a simpler model. Um, and in the clinic for stroke, for example, what you have most of the time is just a lesion mask. That's all you get from a CT or an MRI scan. So we need to have all those complexity in the background to analyze simple data and still make it work in an informative way. So that's one of the ways that we need to figure out how to do that. So, so Jung, if, if I may connect here. So when, when we think about all these many, many data, yeah, at the cellular level that, that you are um, generating and <clears throat> the tools that you are developing, um, well, they are specific, of course, also to to the developmental age. Yeah, and some of the signal cascades are, are completely different when it's uh, uh, prenatally as compared to postnatally. So how much should we put the brain again um, into, the, into its environment in terms of development? Yeah, so all brain initiatives, and we do not exclude ourselves here, also in the human brain project, we, we are focusing very much on the adult human brain. But how important is it uh, to really understand the mechanisms of development of a certain cellular um, genotype or of a certain cellular structure, of a certain cellular molecular signature? And, and how can we consider this in our research? You are muted. We cannot hear you. Young. Is it on our side or your side? Can we help you? I'll check. Good, you shake it. Notre orateur, il parle. son côté. So maybe Toshi, you can start to answer this question and, and then Yong could add. Be because, I mean, in, in Japan, you have probably the same situation, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, from, from the miraculous era to the, you know, the higher level. Okay. Uh, it, on our side, the sound is good, Jan. It must be on your side mm -hmm. that you cut your microphone. Okay. Oh. Ah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're okay, okay. Oh, great. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, uh, so Catherine, yeah, I can hear you very well. So um, for uh, currently, we are focusing on adult uh, stage of the mouse brain. And so moving on the next five years, so we want to support developmental stages and also, you know, cross... Um, from uh, prenatal and through postnatal as well, and in human uh, and non-human primate and the mouse uh, across the whole the li lifespan. And so, yeah, I mean, the uh, uh, human, like many uh, multi-cell organisms, is developed from single uh, fertilized cells. So, so we need to understand um, the mechanism of the development and especially a lot of uh, diseases in brain uh, are related uh, to development. So far, as far as we know, you know, mental disorders, so uh, autism, so all these are, uh, could be um, developmental diseases. And so we try to link from gene uh, to cell and to circuits and to function. So that's what we try to do right now. And so this obviously cross different levels and cross different resolution and scale. And uh, it, as the modalities all need to be tackled. So a lot of fundamental challenges we are facing, but we feel um, Atlas is a good concept uh, to uh, try to integrate, uh, provide a platform uh, to gather the data and the query, enable the query 
and also enable probably collaboration across different labs. So, so we are using right now MouseSpring, you know, CCF developed by uh, Allen Institute. And uh, moving on, so we are currently using uh, human brain CCF also from Allen Brain. I mean, this is a just very uh, a few papers and uh, quite preliminary. I think with time we will have better address, but we have to start somewhere. So, thank you. I could not agree more that the atlas. Uh, is essentially the reference space in which which uh, has an anchoring function in which all data is uh, models also are being anchored and then being rendered interoperable so this uh, expression was used earlier we need a little more than this though uh, Stephanie alluded to the presentation of Andreas Rowald earlier where he also proposed that one can separate certain processes some that need supercompute resources and we solve certain problems on one hand side and then outsource the other uh, processes directly to the patient where we can have less uh, computationally intensive uh, uh, pr uh, processes being represented. This is, these are strategies. This is very good. I have a question to all of you actually from this uh, uh, perspective. Um, interoperability Yes, but can we widen it to multiple? We are having multiple initiatives represented here. Can we increase uh, this in terms of scope and ambition to a collaboration or interoperation of some of the activities in the different initiatives? It's already, very, in our experience, it's already very difficult to do this within eBrains. Yeah? Is there justified ambition to scale it up in terms of collaboration and maybe even interoperation across initiatives. What are your thoughts with regard to this? So uh, maybe, Randy, you're frowning, so why don't you start? Interoperation between interoperation. machine and man. Machine man, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, so in, in your generous introduction, you mentioned that I've been involved in a lot of projects that coordinate large initiatives, and that's, I mean, you and Katrin have been involved in the Human Brain Project, understand the difficulty in coordinating across just something of that scale. Um, I think um, there is a need, there is a, an ambition, there is an intent uh, to do what you're suggesting. Um, I don't think it's going to come necessarily from um, imposition from the people that, or, that um, are the leaders of the initiatives themselves. It will probably act more, those act more as ways to enable collaborations between people who are involved, like students, like postdocs, like new investigators, who um, um, are potentially, uh, I'm going to use the word, less jaded to that kind of interaction. Um, and I see that happening. Uh, certainly um, in, in my trainees, certainly initiatives like, for example, Neuromatch, which is this um, training initiative that was started at the beginning of the, of the COVID pandemic that ended up changing the way that machine learning is taught and expanded it across the entire planet in a way that was not envisioned before. And that kind of collaboration is something that we can do right now. I think that, um, so providing the enabling architecture so that people can collaborate openly is really, I think, where we can contribute a lot, that we being the people who are running these large initiatives. Okay. So um, as you know, um, there are um, seven or eight brain initiatives in the world. Okay, so I think um, my idea is to, uh, to use or be engaged in the international brain initiatives, okay? So we have um, there now um, the uh, data sharing standard of the working group in the IBI. And uh, we have there together from the, the, the scientists from the, the different um, the initiatives and together and uh, good discussions. So it's, a, it's much more difficult, but the, uh, we are much more engaged in the international brain uh, initiative activities, I hope. Um, yeah, it's my, uh, my you know, ideas. Jung, would you like to add? 
Yeah, I think uh, from bottom up and also probably need uh, some top down uh, overview um, as well. And for US Spring Initiative, especially my program, uh, as I mentioned, uh, several hundred investigators across uh, three continents. So we have to, you know, coordinate across all the labs. So to publish even, not think about, you know, how to integrate the data. And so we made this effort, uh, try to work on small brain region and motor cortex. And we achieved some integration across all the projects and published in Nature uh, sometime uh, last year. And so we moving on, and I think uh, we will still try to coordinate uh, even better uh, to ensure all the metadata uh, related to uh, the different individual projects will be well collected and disseminated through uh, the NIH Spring Initiative uh, archives. So right now we have quite a few data archives collecting different data modalities, uh, including genomics, sequencing based data, and then microscopic uh, imaging data, and then at EM level and MRI imaging and EEG, EKG. So all these data are collected by different data archives. It's kind of a distributive uh, model. Um, so we are now thinking how to integrate them, link them together. So, so this is an ongoing effort. I, I hope we will uh, also collaborate with uh, our colleagues in Europe and Japan and try to share our experience uh, to call in the better. If I can add to it, so I think it's going to be a logistic masterpiece bringing everyone together under one roof. Monster piece? <laughs> oh, monster piece. Um, but the motivation is certainly there. Everyone is excited. People see the need for it. And the benefit of it is that none of us could actually acquire that data in our academic lifetime by ourselves. So only by integrating all our efforts do we actually get something very meaningful? And if we make it accessible, usable, and understandable, it will spread like wildfire. Like if it's easy to use and if people see the benefit, it will work. But getting to that point is, is tricky. So we would also like to give you the opportunity to ask our experts. So if there are questions or comments, Please go to the microphones. Can I have a comment for you? Sure. Okay. So uh, as you know, unlike uh, HBP, our brain project is a national ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our government put a huge amount of money to the mm -hmm. to the brain project in uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. But actually, I'm I'm a I'm a, a program officer program officer for this Japan project, but I'm not the a uh, mammoth scientist. I'm a scientist for you know biochemistry, and I love uh, primary culture cells and uh, mice. So um, the other scientists who are not in the project may complain about our project. It's so uh, we have to convince other scientists who are not mammoth who are not mammoth scientists. Mm. So how would you uh, convince the other scientists in the EU? Uh, who are not, uh, you know, uh, involved in the HBP. Okay. Well, we had, I would say, a comparable problem. And mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, it's natural. You have to start at a certain time point with a certain consortium, a group. But then it is important uh, to, to broaden it up. And the idea of our vision paper um, that we have just published uh, in the fourth version was precisely to open up this discussion and, and to, to make the discussion more inclusive. Um, and I'm, I'm deeply convinced that it is important to go beyond the, the smaller community, but also without, so to say, having another fragmentation at the beginning. So it's really a difficult question how to run such mm -hmm. big research, I would say. Um, 
and it's good to hear that um, that you are dealing with the same question. We we can mm -hmm. learn from it other yeah. also how to do it. Yeah, in the next project that we would like to where you know include not only the marmoset scientists but also the basic scientists um, who are uh, you know use engaged in the C. elegans and Drosophila and the mice and the other you know pure basic science. It's uh, integration is a very important I think. Can I make a quick comment on this also? A project, by definition, always has a beginning and an end. Yeah. Yeah? So it has a finite lifetime. Um, what we are seeing now at the end of the Human Brain Project, it continues. There is uh, a legacy in eBrains, and there, there is the opening towards uh, the community. The opening has already happened earlier, but now to the integration of the entire community with building up of community input from bottom up. This takes time. It's a slow process. It's an obligatory and imperative process, but it's slower than very often uh, the timescales on a project are shorter, and these two things uh, cannot be necessarily integrated, but they can be synchronized with each other. And that would be pot a potential advice that you could consider. But now let's do, do this the opposite and do it quick and fast. So, so what is, in your view, the biggest challenge answered in one sentence. What is the biggest challenge in brain research in the next decade? Who would like to start? I can go first. Um, <laughs> so the biggest challenge that I can see in my niche at the moment is reliable predictions that actually make a difference to people's lives longer term. Thank you very much. Jung, would you? Hmm? like to add, what is the biggest challenge in the next decade? Uh, well, I think still the, I, I'm still thinking about uh, data uh, integration. I, I certainly I, I understand the challenge, uh, fundamental challenge uh, about integration of heterogeneous uh, brain uh, data. And unlike, you know, genome sequencing, so we have just sequencing data. So now we are collecting all kinds of uh, data <laughs> across um, using different technologies. So uh, how to uh, integrate them and develop some standards and make it easy, as, as you know, uh, <laughs> pointed out by the panelists, uh, rather than uh, thinking too complicated and so we, we do need to have some kind of standards for people to gather the data. Thank you. That's a challenge. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, personally, I think it's a dementia science. Um, so dementia. So uh, to prevent a cure of dementia, uh, so we have to develop a new uh, cutting technology and uh, collaboration throughout the world. Uh, because um, the dementia is a very much uh, the huge problem, not only in Japan and the, the other countries in the world. So I uh, think, uh, really think about the dementia science, I think. Thank you. <clears throat> Randy? Yeah. Um, I think I'll just add that a lot of what uh, we've been talking about sort of ignores the, the embodied nature of, of brain function and that the brain, um, it's in our head and in our bodies and um, in our social interactions. And um, we've sort of ignored that by and large. There was a great, great talk on the consciousness um, uh, session this morning about are robots conscious and the fact that we you can move doesn't make you conscious, for example. And the part of that has to do with the fact that there is this very com complicated architecture in your head um, that's interacting with, with the motor system, interacting with, with the uh, system outside of your body. And understanding those social and cultural interactions may actually change how we think about brain function. And I think that's one challenge that we really haven't tapped um, in any serious way right now, but it is one that we should be tapping into. That could change how we address inequities and in, um, how our, our brains are affected, but also how we uh, uh, talk about uh, clinical um, treatments as well. And so indeed we see that there are several areas where, where we expect um, New insights, where we need new insights, uh, the patient dimension is uh, extremely important for, for all of us, I would say. But also the, the question how to tackle the data yeah, and, and really make sense of them. It's not just data. These are very different data. And uh, it took us here in, in Europe uh, for eBrains, uh, as you, a, a lot of time to develop uh, a platform, a basis uh, to, to handle that and bring that together then for the, for the benefit of patients, of course, and 
also for, for deeper insights. Yeah, well, Chris, Victor, any more questions uh, that we have? No, I think we can We can, we can thank our, our, guests, our guests very much and uh, Jung uh, at uh, virtual in the meeting, but also you here and thank you very much for your attention and for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.